Okay. Uh, delighted to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, my charge is to summarize a lot of the, the work uh, that you've seen over uh, the entire day and put in context of what science we need to go forward with and uh, how can we influence uh, policy and, and regulations over certainly the food supply in general, health, and, uh, and including uh, yogurt. Um, my disclosures um, and uh, the, the themes, I'll, 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 I'll go through the, the, this talk. Um, to a certain extent, uh, look at what, what yogurt was so we can see where the origins and, and how it provided value. Uh, what yogurt is today and, uh, and how it's being positioned from a, a, a health perspective, and, and also speculate a little bit what, what one could imagine yogurt providing uh, in, the, in, the, in the diet if some of the opportunities could be realized. Uh, and my underlying theme is uh, the 20th century was basically a, a very chemistry-dominated approach to food and what food is. Uh, this century, we will be understanding more and more what food does, and, and that will change dramatically how we view certain foods, and, and I would argue especially yogurt. Um, the context also has to be put into consideration. Um, relative to the scientific investment, what we understand about, about health, uh, and, and certainly the cost uh, of, of health today, we should be the healthiest people in the history uh, of humans. And interestingly, some, some are. Uh, Jaring and Roger are enjoying the sports. They learned as children, they're both over 100. So as illustrated earlier, there's a, there's a wonderful possibility to have a spectacular lifespan and health during it. But unfortunately, many, in fact, the majority of people are not. And, and we have to be honest, diet is a very important contributor to that. So, so in context, we, we have a lot to do. So what was yogurt? Uh, originally. In fact, it was a, a, in essence, a low lactose, high lactic acid, stable milk. Uh, all the other aspects of it really weren't considered. It was a delivery system for milk. And, and I want to emphasize, and there's been a lot of talk uh, today, over the day, uh, about milk and an and, and almost surprise at, at why it would be beneficial. But we have to look at it from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, lactation in mammals evolved specifically to be a comprehensive food for mammalian infants. It shouldn't be a surprise that it's good for you. In fact, as we study lactation uh, in, a, in a genomic uh, perspective, uh, we are way undervaluing this asset. Um, we find, for example, that that milk is personal, it's active, it's dynamic, it's structured in remarkable ways. Um, that's not his perception. The perception is that milk's bad for you, uh, and many consumers avoid it, uh, and the perception has come from a great deal of, uh, of suspicion because of surrogate biomarkers of risks of diseases of, uh, of middle-aged white men. And, and now the epidemiology is coming out. And we can answer the question with relative confidence. Does consuming milk and dairy products in a population predispose individuals to increased risk, even middle-aged white men? And, and, and we've seen various data through the course of the day. I like Peter Elwood's uh, data because he's, he's not a milk dairy uh, scientist. Uh, and, and he takes outcome data, uh, not markers. And for heart disease, stroke, diabetes, virtually all forms of cancer, invariably uh, the relative risk of death in that uh, UK population proved to be less than one. Uh, interestingly, he, he sees, uh, as, as others have, a very slight increase in, uh, in risk of, uh, of prostate cancer. So, uh, and, and it's also being speculated that this could be an artifact uh, that that this is a unique uh, property of middle-aged white men, but we also have to allow for the possibility that, that evolution doesn't like politicians either. The very value of milk is clear. Uh, individuals in populations who have been examined and who consume milk are taller, leaner, stronger, break fewer bones at all ages, and live longer. That's milk. 
And so as a delivery system for these benefits, yogurt has clearly been very valuable. Uh, and uh, as Andrew pointed out uh, uh, in his talk this morning, this has had a profound effect on the evolution of human beings. Uh, those uh, societies that have, as a, 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 in essence, agricultural and dietary practice availed themselves of, uh, of, of bovine milk as a dietary choice have had a rather profound effect on their genetics. Uh, and to put that in context, that very strong Darwinian selective pressure, uh, whether it's on... Uh, on survival or, or, or on reproduction, it has been the strongest single dietary influence on the human genome in, uh, in, in recent recorded history. What that means is in those populations in which milk was a dietary option, those who genetically, and in fact, could not avail themselves of lacta lactose digestion through their lifetime, are gone from the gene pool. They have no descendants. It's the ones who could that dominate the gene pool. Uh, that's a remarkable observation for a particular dietary choice. And so in considering uh, the value of, of consuming these products, it, it's, it, it's rather remarkable. Um, so from a policy perspective, uh, again, there's a genuine evolutionary reason why milk in all mammals and, and bovine included are comprehensive, balanced, and highly bioavailable sources of all nutrients. So from a policy perspective, you should push for that being the criteria that you evaluate all foods. And we saw quantitative uh, efforts to do that uh, and measuring the, the quality of foods from a, a, a nutrient perspective we should also encourage that we do that from an individual consumer perspective. It's vital that people know what the quality of their diets are so that they can put the quality of particular food choices in that context. And discouragingly, few people have a good quality diet. They need to know that. So policy that pushes that would be valuable. So what, your, what is yogurt today? It's more than just milk. Uh, it is uh, milk with lactose digesting uh, bacteria in defined numbers and viability, and that's important. So increasingly, yogurt is being defined as a milk product with bacteria, viable bacteria. And it's coming at a very interesting point in scientific history. We are now recognizing that the bacteria within us are remarkably important, that we house uh, a, a very uh, abundant and diverse population of, uh, of bacteria within our intestine, and that turns out to be very important for health. The big question is, does diet influence that? The bacteria in us, are they simply the result of an inoculation that has only to do with fa factors intrinsic to us and independent of diet, or is diet important? And actually, the best evidence that diet's important, ironically, comes from lactation. And research uh, that we and others have been pursuing uh, gives you an example of just how important diet can be in controlling uh, the microbiota, and it comes from lactation. Um, human milk. Uh, we've been studying human milk and uh, keeping in mind what human milk is, uh, in essence, for nourishing babies. It was one of uh, our, our most remarkable observations that that human milk is chock-a-block full of undigestible material. It goes right through the baby. The baby cannot digest it. Uh, and, and of course, the question was, what, what, what is it? And uh, it turns out to be, for all intents and purposes, very hidden molecules. Uh, Carlito Labrilia is, uh, is, is the world's leading analytical chemist in glycobiology, and he has literally spent his entire career developing the analytical capabilities to find these very difficult to, uh, to describe molecules. And it turns out they're complex oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides, meaning they're polymers, short polymers of different sugars. Complex, I say that very literally. If you're a chemist and you look at the array of oligosaccharides in, uh, in, in human milk, what's conspicuous is how complex they are. It looks like evolution took great intent in making it a mixture of complex molecules. 
that's important. It's also uh, a property of mammalian lactation. We have gone back through primates, through, uh, through cows, sheep, mice, rats, all the way back to marsupials. This property of containing complex conjugates, oligosaccharides, is present in every milk analyzed. Interestingly, throughout the evolution of mammals, the complexity and concentration of these oligosaccharides has gone up, illustrating that evolution has continued to reinforce their presence. But of course, why are they there? If they go right through the baby, why are they providing a benefit? So, uh, David Mills is, uh, is, is an internationally recognized expert in microbiology. He's a microbial ecologist. He studies microbial ecosystems and everything from uh, bacteria in wine to the bacteria in the intestine of humans. We isolated the oligosaccharides, gave them to David to test whether bacteria grow on them. And the striking property of these oligosaccharides is bacteria cannot grow on them. He tried bacterium after bacterium after bacterium, and they don't grow on them. These are not food for bacteria. But, of course, then he found one, Bifidobacteria infantis. What a surprise from the intestine of breastfed babies. And that's genuinely the genius of milk. David has sequenced the entire genome of this, uh, this organism, and in fact, it has 700 genes unique from other Bifidobacteria. And when you map the, the bifidobacteria genome, dozens of genes are encoding the enzymes that specifically map to those complex oligosaccharide linkages. It's that symbiosis, that interaction between the oligosaccharides selecting only those bacteria with this complement of genes that are able to, to grow. That's the genius of milk. Mothers are literally recruiting another life form to babysit their baby. So, apologies to over a dozen scientists who have assembled this one figure. Carlita Liberty has an assembled analytical platform so we can study all of the oligosaccharides quantitatively, simultaneously in a sample of milk. He has developed the same analytical platform so you can see the entire complement of oligosaccharides and their concentration in baby poop. So he can follow the oligosaccharides going into a baby and the oligosaccharides going out of a baby. And in the first week of, uh, of life, the oligosaccharides go right through the baby. For the first two weeks, and some babies even for the first three weeks. But then, dramatically, all the oligosaccharides begin to go down. They disappear. And of course, where are they going? They're going into very specific bacteria. If you look at the bacterial population in babies for the first couple of weeks, it's rather chaotic. And a variety of, uh, of bacteria clearly associated with inoculation at birth. But over the first three weeks, increasingly you see bifidobacteria. And by two to four weeks of, uh, of lactation, the microbiota population of a normal birth breastfed infant, and we've looked at babies now uh, from around the world, is dramatically dominated. 90% of the biomass of bacteria in a breastfed baby poop is a single bacterial strain. This dominance of, uh, of, the, of the microbiota of infants is, is clear. The es explicit establishment and maintenance of that infant microbiota is through diet mammalian lactation. So in fact, we now know that the bacteria within us are critical. Evolution spent a tremendous amount of investment in, uh, in genomics and, uh, and in resources to, to, to manipulate it to, uh, to the specific protective effect. Simultaneous scientists from around the world are looking and identifying a variety of other properties in adult microbiota. At weaning, the infant microbiota changes, the oligosaccharides, of course, go away, and we transition into an adult microbiota. We don't transition into the same microbiota, and the question is, does it matter? Well, this field was literally catalyzed by Jeff Gordon and his remarkable observations, just taking overweight and normal weight uh, Americans and demonstrating that the microbiota was different. This sparked a, literally a race to look at different phenotypes. The Danes have demonstrated that diabetics have different microbiota. 
A variety of studies have shown that various intestinal problems, irritable bowel disease, inflammatory bowel diseases, all have different microbiota. The most recent is the most compelling. Jeff Gordon has taken discordant twins from Malawi, a very, very poor part of the world where children get kwashiorkor, this, uh, this basically developmental disease that we are all taught uh, in early nutrition is a direct consequence of a diet that's very poor in energy and protein. It's basically a malnourishment disease. Strikingly, in Malawi, they were able to identify 300 sets of twins in which one of the twins had kwashiorkor and one did not. How could this be? They're twins. They're exposed to what one I'm assuming is almost identical environments. And certainly mothers are not feeding one more than the other. What could it be? He took the microbiota from these discordant twins and lo and behold, the microbiota was different. Then he did what only Jeff Gordon can do. He took germ-free mice, mice with zero bacteria in them, and he took the bacterial population from the intestine of kwashiorkor positive and kwashiorkor negative twins. He transferred those bacteria to mice, put them on an energy-restricted diet, and they reproduced the phenotype of uh, kwashiorkor in these mice. It's the microbiota that's driving this. Clearly, our entire system uh, of metabolism is sensitive to the bacteria within us. It's critical that we can understand and begin to manipulate it. The only food that is genuinely has the capability simultaneously to alter the microbiota of, uh, of, of Inuits today in the marketplace is yogurt. Given the spectacular observations of the importance of the microbiota, how does the population of consumers perceive yogurt today, its assets? It's got milk, proteins, and viable bacteria. But against that, they put the liabilities of fat, saturated fat, trans fat, and sugars. And most people are literally unaware of the potential. The problem is, we have no metrics of probiotic benefits. We are not able to document in scientific evidence or much less to the consumer of these benefits. What can yogurt become? Yogurt over the next few years can become the ideal delivery system for a synergistic ensemble of milk, milk components, and select bacteria as a bioreactor. We can literally imagine yogurt becoming a remarkable engine of the tuning of our own uh, microbiota. That means we're going to talk about synergies. How can we possibly imagine that milk and the bacteria begin to interact in ways that makes them better than either separately? That's genuinely what yogurt should become. So what would that look like? Bacteria making milk better, milk making bacteria better. Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, and again, it comes from work we've been doing with, uh, with infants. Um, we've been studying milk, human milk, in babies. We don't ask, what is milk? We ask, what does a baby turn milk into? That means we have to sample milk as it's digested within actual babies. We're asking a variety of questions with this model. Uh, for example, our Babies that are developmentally compromised or premature babies able to digest and take advantage of, of milk normally. But what's striking is the assumption has always been that milk and milk proteins hit the stomach, strong acid, aggressive protease enzymes, and it's broken down into amino acids for nourishment. But in point of fact, that's not true. In infants, there basically is not low pH. They can't make enough acid. And their proteases are virtually ineffective. What happens? The milk has a variety of endogenous proteases that are inhibited in the milk in the mammary gland. But when they get into the stomach of the baby, the proteases are released, and they begin to disassemble milk proteins. Milk is disassembling itself. But what's most remarkable is it's not breaking it down into amino acids. It's breaking it down into very specific peptides. And those peptides are proving to be 
excruciatingly difficult to analyze, but we can now do that. And when we examine those peptides, they're having remarkable biological activities. And this work uh, in part of Dave Dallas, who's a postdoc who's, uh, who's here in the audience. So, so literally, milk is an encrypted system of biological activities for the infant. And many of those activities will not be released in, in adults. So we're going to have to imagine ways that we can selectively release those encrypted peptides. And food-grade microbial systems is an obvious example. So what bacteria could do for enhancing milk, release these encrypted peptides. It could certainly bioconvert oligosaccharides in ways that, uh, that are, are, are remarkable. It's already been shown that they can isomerize uh, complex lipids. And we can easily imagine that they would eliminate allergens. Um, how would milk enhance bacteria? We know that milk and the components of milk activate specific genes and entire pathways in bacteria. The phenotype of bacteria is different depending on what they grow on. So in fact, milk selectively encourages very interesting pathways in specific bacteria. Of course, milk would very successfully and does protect the viability of bacteria, ensuring that they can arrive in the lower intestine viable. And the surface expression of the bacteria, an important aspect of by which they bind to the intestine, interact with the, the, the microbiota as they go through, and interact with toxins and pathogens is dependent on their surface. And again, the surface expression of both proteins and carbohydrate on the surface of bacteria is a function of what they're growing on. So we can imagine that milk could dramatically enhance bacteria. So yogurt's future Certainly one could imagine it's a cornerstone to personalizing health. As we begin to understand the variation between individuals, uh, as Connie talked about, life stages for growth, development, protection for particular aspects. We can change the resource itself. Juan Medrano in the Animal Science Program has mapped the entire bovine genome for oligosaccharides. Bovine makes the oligosaccharides. It includes the oligosaccharides in milk, but a calf only needs it for a week. That means that only bovine colostrum has high levels of oligosaccharides. For the rest of lactation, they're relatively low. But in fact, they're in waste or, uh, dairy streams, and Daniela Barilla has developed ways to isolate them, for example, from waste streams. So we can imagine capturing the oligosaccharides as we know them for various applications. And then ultimately beginning to go after uh, the microbiota of at-risk clinical populations. Ultimately, this is going to be a very important target for the activity of, of, of products like, like yogurt. So why do we not see these now? Why is the policy and regulation perspective so negative to these potential benefits? I refer to this as the tyranny of outcome. That is to say, claims are based on outcomes. If you can't measure the outcome, you cannot claim it. And not surprisingly, most of our outcome measures for health today are based on the diseases of middle-aged white men. They control the money. They control the markers. What we don't have are good markers of the processes of health. And as a result, we cannot estimate, much less claim, the benefits to protection, prevention, and performance. These are the benefits that one would anticipate from, uh, from milk and lactation. Uh, they do not have evidentiary proof because we don't have the measures of that yet. And the reason why we are getting uh, the results that you see from EFSA, from FDA, et cetera, is because they will allow claims based on evidence. If you don't have evidence, you can't claim it. So the biggest and the most important goal of the entire microbiota field and any of those who are going to play in it, yogurt, is to develop the basis of evidence, which means you have to develop metrics of, of their effect. Uh, I wish this was a new idea. Uh, Galileo said it. Uh, so we're late. Uh, and it's possible. Uh, we at UC Davis are building, in essence, what we call a human phenotyping program where we measure all aspects of phenotypic health, not disease diagnostics, health measures. Measure the processes from uh, anthropomorphic ones, uh, as, as Connie described, all the way to activity and sleep. Give people quantitative measures of their health status and let the 
marketplace compete to improve it. If you do that, then foods will genuinely have to compete to be able to improve health. In that marketplace, yogurt would do extremely well. In fact, measuring the microbiota will be much simpler than you think. It turns out the vast majority of microbial metabolites grow through your blood, through your kidneys, and out your bladder. What that means is urine is an excellent uh, biofluid in which to sample uh, the products of, the, of microbial metabolism. Carolyn Slupsky, uh, an uh, associate professor at the University of California, Davis, is a diaper diagnostician. She puts a cotton ball in the diaper of babies, takes it out, pops it in an MR tube, and she can tell which babies are developing their microbiota appropriately and which ones aren't. But very importantly, she can show the ones who aren't, and as we give them a product that improves it, that it's working. The claimed benefit be can, can be shown in urine alone. So what we need, we need detailed functional analysis of the bacterial strains that we have and that we consume. This will be critical. We have to develop metrics of individual diversity. We are different. The bacteria in us are different. Science has to move quickly to be able to annotate those bacteria and their functions. As we understand that, all of their effects will become knowable and controllable. We need acute metrics of yogurt's eff efficacy. We, in essence, need to be able to estimate exactly what yogurt and products that manipulate the microbiota are, are doing in an acute sense. <clears throat> Waiting for decade-long outcomes is not going to be the, the approach. Timing now changes with the mind to be able to make claims, measure the outcomes. But the future is not going to be that. What we're going to have to do is deliver to individuals the ability so they can measure their own health. And by measuring their own health and their own health status, literally take control of that individually. We would imagine, in fact, that should be very soon, that the population will not rely on policy regulation for their health. They will take control of it themselves, they'll measure it, and they'll literally enlist the entire food marketplace to improve it. And at that point, again, yogurt should do very well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Do you have any questions? Rapid questions? If not, I see our chairman that is coming. Oh. OK, so maybe last question. Bruce, that was a great talk as usual. And you know your slide about mapping health and how to measure that, I think, is really so critical right now. But I think we need to be careful um, in the whole concept of biomarkers, because at the end of the day, the, you know, it's very rare to find a biomarker that's really going to correlate with an actual health endpoint that's going to matter to people. And I think that, you know, that's really where the research needs to be, is to just to make sure that's a solid link. And I think, the, you know, the blood cholesterol story and all of that are just perfect examples of decisions made on biomarkers that just weren't correct. Right. No, I, 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 if, if you got the impression that I want yogurt to develop biomarkers, please absolve yourself of that. What we need to be able to do is measure processes and get accurate estimates of how our processes are functioning. Um, the, the notion that we can find a single target of health, a single marker of that, and then drive a single drug to executing on that, uh, we now know that that's folly. Interestingly, milk teaches that. Milk doesn't work on targets. Milk has strategies, and it takes pleiotrophic ensembles of mechanisms at those strategies. But we need to be able to measure how it's doing. We need to be able to measure how we're doing, and we need to be able to measure that, uh, that, that diet, lifestyle, is improving that. So that's really what we're talking about. Not a single biomarker. That 20th century, leave that behind. Accurate, as accurate assessors of our, of our actual health. That's processes performance. Thank you very much. <laughs>